One of my, uh, one of my late father's favourite sayings was, there are none so blind as those who will not see. And I think for many years, uh, very many people here, including, including our legislators at Westminster and Stormont, have chosen to be blind to the thousands of women forced to leave our shores over the decades in search of access to proper health care, as is their human right. We are very privileged to have a very strong lineup of expert speakers on the panel this morning, and we'll be shortly hearing from uh, Donna Stenson of the British uh, Pregnancy Advisory Service, Heather Lowe from the Family Planning Association, Don Purvis of Mary Stokes International, and Rita Hughes from the Royal College of Midwives. And it's brilliant, absolutely phenomenal to have such an accomplished all-woman panel to speak on what's primarily a woman's rights issue. You don't have to be a woman to stand up for uh, women's rights. And today uh, we have a, a, a brave man who's going to join us uh, up here uh, after the, the panel have, have said their piece as MLA for East Derry, uh, Cahill O'Hoshin, who is going to share his family's uh, personal story with us as well. But first, uh, to take you through the main findings and the recommendations from uh, the Amnesty Research, uh, please welcome our Northern Ireland campaigner, uh, Grania Tavid. And before I take you through the key headline strands of our report, let me say very clearly from the outset that our laws are utterly draconian and the criminal penalties attached to these are among the harshest in Europe. Life imprisonment for women undergoing an unlawful abortion and for anyone assisting her, that sentence even applies in pregnancies where there are fatal, fatal abnormalities where there's no compatibility with life, and where women have been raped or are victims of incest. That grim distinction with the rest of Europe should be a wake-up call to our politicians. Abortions are, as we know, only lawful in extremely restricted circumstances, namely where there is a risk to a woman's life or a real and serious long-term or permanent damage to her physical and mental health. In practice, the law is even more restrictive. For many women, demonstrating a long-term risk to health, particularly mental health, and overcoming the barriers to accessing abortion in Northern Ireland is often an insurmountable challenge. The shameful lack of political action by some on this key issue has helped to create a climate of fear for our medical professionals. At least 1,000 women are forced to leave Northern Ireland every year just to access healthcare to which they are and should be entitled. <clears throat> Travel only adds to the trauma that women experience. Our laws are in urgent need of reform. For those who are from marginalised communities, there are additional barriers still. But abortion stigma is not just an amalgamation of intangible expressions of deeply held and pervasive set of socio-cultural beliefs and practices. Abortion stigma also finds expression in regular public demonstrations and in some instances, harassment. Outside sexual and reproductive health clinics and takes the form of both veiled and open threats to healthcare providers working in these organisations and the women who use their services. Without exception, the interviewees recounted instances in which they had been harassed by anti-choice activists. Some also recounted instances in which women and girls visiting their premises both to access abortion advice and for other reasons, and in some instances, women visiting other organisations in the same building had been pursued down the street by anti-choice activists and harassed. Our devolved authorities need to redress historical inequality, <coughs> discrimination, limited choices and restrictive freedoms for the region's women and girls. In failing to live up to international human rights obligations, the UK government is also responsible for the human rights violations experienced by women and girls in Northern Ireland who seek abortion services. And this report, as you'll see, concludes with recommendations which outlines what our devolved authorities and the government of the UK must do to ensure a society that respects and upholds sexual and reproductive rights instead of restricting and repressing <coughs> them. And before I go to our panel, I'll leave you with this quote from a 25-year-old student who had to travel to England. I would ask those in power to please change the law and make it fair and to bring Northern Ireland in line with the rest of the UK. 
I would ask them to make it okay for women to ask for an abortion and not to be made to feel like our reasons are frivolous and self-serving. Thank you. Medical technology is ever evolving. It changes and adapts as new knowledge becomes available. Biodiagnostic techniques are very sophisticated and despite what Dr. Alistair MacDonald says, <laughs> my medical colleagues very rarely get it wrong. So there's a case almost of sticking fingers in the ears and going, la 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 la. I can tell you have been pregnant, I can tell you I'm no longer pregnant, please don't tell me how you got to me in this condition. This is no way to work in this day and age. So I would call on everybody out there to use whatever sphere of influence you move in to put pressure on, sorry about this, our politicians, this is a devolved matter, they can make a decision, they should make a decision, and while they're trying to make a decision, could they please, please issue some guidance? I'm here today to give a voice to the women, all 60,000 of them since 1970, that have travelled over the sea to an unfamiliar place for care that they should and can clinically get at home. I'm also here to represent my colleagues who are frustrated and dismayed by the disregard your government has for their own women. Enough is enough. No politician in a civilised country should force a woman to make a journey away from their loved ones for abortion care because making the decision to end a pregnancy is journey enough. These days, diagnosis in utero means that we are information empowered. That means that we're able to make decisions about our own family lives. Imagine being afforded essential medical information about your pregnancy or child and experiencing the hopelessness that may create when something isn't as it should be. The pain is then further compounded by being told that if you choose to end the pregnancy, we won't help you. You'll have to find, in some circumstances, thousands of pounds to pay for treatment and travel, <coughs> be away from your support network, potentially have to lie to your loved ones, and often do something you thought you'd never have to do, or maybe hoped you'd never have to do. Can you imagine that once you've made that journey, found the money, arrived at the clinic, had your treatment, and to top it all off, having to have a conversation about what to do with your fetal remains? Then the only option is to bring your baby home in a container in your luggage and having to tell the stranger at the airport what it is and why. I don't think you can imagine. Please don't misunderstand me though, Mr. Politician from Northern Ireland. BPAS will be here for as long as it takes to make the change to ensure treatment can be accessed in Northern Ireland. We will be proud to continue to support your women and families. We will hold their hands. We will use, their kind, we will use kind words we will facilitate and guide them. We will help them make their arrangements to get their babies home. We will give them the best quality care and the highest of compassion. We will comfort them. We'll take care of your women until your government does. I'm very sure that you'll know and understand why the FPA feels that the law as it stands is of absolutely no use to women in this situation and it needs to change. As an organisation, the FPA has fought tirelessly for many years, I'm all right, Lauren, I'm going to feel oh, it. Oh, yeah, it's like, oh, gosh, she's going to cry. I'm not going to cry. No. I've just, <laughs> just worked up. <laughs> um, as an and I'm nearly finished as well. Um, as an organisation, the FPA has fought tirelessly for many years to have this, <coughs> right put wrong, this wrong put right. Um, and we absolutely welcome the growing number of voices that recognise things need to change. Women need to be able to make difficult choices and painful decisions and know that they can access a health service that supports the, these decisions and a government that also protects their right to do so. If you're a woman that lives in Glasgow and you're pregnant as a result of rape, you can access a safe, free and legal abortion. If you're a woman that lives in Leeds and you've become pregnant as a result of rape <coughs> and want to access abortion, you can do so safely, freely and legally. If you're a young girl who's become pregnant as a result of incest or sexual abuse and you live in Liverpool or London, you can access an abortion free, safe and legally. If you're a woman who's become pregnant as a result of rape and you happen to live in Oman, 
you're not entitled to have an abortion here. If you're a 13-year-old girl who's become pregnant as a result of incest and you happen to live in Belfast, you can't have an abortion here. Women in Northern Ireland, according to our assembly, cannot be trusted to make decisions about their own bodies. According to our assembly, women cannot be trusted to make decisions about their own reproductive system. According to our assembly, women are stupid and therefore politicians must decide what they do with their bodies and what they do for themselves. And currently that means if you're pregnant as a result of rape or you're pregnant as a result of incest <coughs> or sexual abuse, you must remain pregnant for 40 weeks. Tough, suck it up, that's what the law says. It's been a long journey coming here to this point today and I've met many people along the way and there's been a lot of tears cried and it is emotional and if I do break down I apologise in the first instance um, but it's something I've been passionate about and uh, I've carried with me. Um, myself and my wife were married in the year 2000 and we talk about in the countryside uh, oops, Ghosts like me, we talk about having a long forenoon. I had a very long forenoon before we were married, but we were married uh, nine months, I think, and ten days when when uh, our son was born. Our son is he's now thirteen. He uh, is nearly six foot. He's a heartbreaker, not just mine and his mother's. <laughs> but uh, we were very, very proud and, and pleased with with him, and life was good for us. I found a new job, a job that I could have. Uh, Wrote, written the uh, job description for it. an absolutely perfect job. And my wife was transferred from her job here in Belfast to Derry, and that life balance issue uh, was beautiful for us. So it meant that we could uh, spend a lot more time together and everything. And I would commend Michelle and Ada to end up just on the side because she's decided to move the, her department actually down the country as well. For and that will mean a lot for a lot of people as well. So at that time, at that time of my life, life was very, very good. And I didn't think maybe it could get any better and my wife uh, told me one morning that uh, she was pregnant again and I was absolutely delighted. And the pregnancy went on for quite a few of them, uh, weeks and months passed and she had all the normal symptoms and everything were perfect twinges and I suppose normal sickness and, and kicks eventually or whatever and uh, I'd say there was nothing. There was nothing terribly uh, awry or nothing showed. And she also had that woman's intuition that th this was a daughter and uh, uh, it proved to be thus. So she went for her scan, uh, her first, uh, her, I think it was a 16 week scan. And uh, on that morning she said to me, listen, go to your work. Uh, I'm fine, I'll be okay. And I'll ring you when it's over because I'm going on to my work. And uh, she did ring, and that was the phone call, I suppose, that and, uh, I would always see her in my mind because she was absolutely distraught, she was quite hysterical. And I actually thought in the first instance she'd been involved in a road traffic accident, but all she could say there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And uh, we went home and we sat down and didn't know where to turn her, what have you. And uh, the two of us went the next morning to see the consultant. Um, was asked out. And it gave us the story of, it was the first time I'd heard the word of Anna Kefali. And basically from day one they had said, listen, this is not survivable, this is not uh, tenable. Uh, your baby will die or will be born dead or will die immediately at birth. Uh, but after about a month or six weeks, we sat down and we just, when we said, she said she made a decision, she said, listen, I want to continue this this pregnancy. So again we took some advice on the matter and she did continue the pregnancy. And uh, our baby was born and died in the same minute, in the same second, in the same instant. And uh, we gave her a name and took her home as a service and she had I say she has a name and she has a grave. And it was only after that I suppose that I looked at what the options that we would have had had we decided to go for the termination or for abortion. And I was absolutely horrified that had we decided such, first of all, it wouldn't have been available. 
Second of all, if it had been, we would have had to go across the water. In a small way, I hope that I maybe changed party policy, and I would hope that perhaps this testimony here today, the testimony of those women who came, and couples who came forward to me, uh, might change the legislation that will cover certainly fatal fetal vulnerability. And I hope that it brings the discussion to the floor of the Assembly, uh, that we look at this very, very uh, critical uh, uh, issue that affects, I think, somewhere in the region of a thousand women, women per annum. I'm Donna from the British Pregnancy Advisory Service and we look after your women in England when they travel for abortion services and what I want to say to the politicians of Northern Ireland is while you continue to abandon your women we will continue to be proud to look after them. I'm Brady Hughes, I'm from the Royal College of Midwives in Northern Ireland and I'd like to say to our politicians on behalf of the midwives in Northern Ireland you must remember that every single woman who is diagnosed with a baby with a serious fetal anomaly is a woman that needs cared for, who needs to be respected, and she needs to be supported in whatever choice she makes about the future of that pregnancy.